The 1940s was a time of racial segregation in the South. There were separate schools for Negro and white students, colored only and white only water fountains, segregated eating establishments, movie theaters, and segregated buses. Baton Rouge only had one swimming pool, and it was for whites only. I was only two when uh, my brother drowned. There was a lot of pain. It was tragic. And the school and the community went in mourning with a determination that they were going to help do something about it. For many, it was the worst of times, but it was also the best of times. Funding for this program has been provided by the East Baton Rouge Parish School System and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. The Negro community of Old South Baton Rouge was self-sufficient in many ways. People found almost everything they needed within a mile of their own neighborhood. There were churches and schools, barber shops and beauty salons, restaurants and grocery stores, gas stations and clothing stores. Negro dentists and doctors lived and worked in the community. North Boulevard was on the north side, East Washington Street on the south side, Park Boulevard was on the east side, and East Boulevard was on the west side. We knew just about everybody uh, during those times, and it was a close-knit community. We would all work together on projects. There were a number of businesses in the area that were doing very well economically and created some jobs in our community. We had King's Garage, Earl Marcel, Mr. Marcel's service station on Washington Street, restaurants, Chicken Shack, you had Purse's Barbecue, you had uh, Bernard's Ideal Drugstore that had a snack shop in it, uh, as well as a drugstore, a two-story building, like a shopping center. Dr. Leo Butler had his office in it. You had bakery shops, Tasty Bakery on Washington Street. You had Pan Dandy Bakery Shop on Myrtle Street. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Fish Market, Holland Fish Market, uh, probably the only fish market in the area that serviced everybody. We had the Rhythm Club. Uh, which a lot of celebrities came to. Ike and Tina Turner, I remember them. I mean, just about everybody you can mention. B.B. King, Bobby Bland, all of them. Uh, cab stands, uh, Mr. Charlie Davison had a huge cab stand. The service stations, Horatio and Mr. Buffington, Robert Buffington and his brother. Negro um, children played in front yards and on sidewalks in their community with their immigrant white neighbors typically of Jewish and Italian ancestry. Jim Crow laws, however, prevented these same children from going to school together. And living side by side, Negro patrons supported and helped sustain businesses owned by Jewish and Italian Americans. Relationships between these businessmen and the Negro community were good. The social environment also thrived. The Temple Roof Garden uh, was the real center of entertainment and just about every black artist of note in the country at some time or another played on the temple roof. Uh, Cab Calloway, uh, Louis Jordan, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, all of these, these stars uh, played dances and what have you up there. They had a uh, the, uh, big dance with Louis Armstrong's band and uh, that was the group that helped promote the dance. Entertainment varied widely. We would dress in cowboy clothes, or cowgirl clothes, and uh, play country music and uh, we borrowed the a big picture of Elsie the cow from the Borden Company uh, to help decorate and we had a lot of fun at 
a dance like that. There were celebrities from all over that used to come to the Chicken Shack. Some that I remember were people like Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Willie Mays, Duke Ellerton, Count Basie. Uh, I know Sam Cooke came because I was running it at the time that Sam Cooke came. The Temple Roof was not the only hot spot in the African American community. The Purple Circle Social Club, Lincoln Theater, and Apex Social Club all buzzed with activity. Many of the entertainers who came to Baton Rouge had few options about where they could spend the night. No matter how wealthy, no matter how prominent, Jim Crow laws denied them access to local hotels and motels. These fellas used to live in a residence uh, run by a lady that we all only knew as Miss Sang. And that was near Perkins Road too. One of the thrills that I had as a boy was when these musicians and these artists uh, had a little time to come out and relax. They would come out on the school campus where some of us were playing ball and, all, and play ball along with them. As early as 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court said in Plessy versus Ferguson that as long as separate facilities for Negroes and whites are similar, they are equal. The ruling provided a legal foundation for government approved and supported separation of the races in public recreational facilities. It did not guarantee colored people their own facilities. Despite the vast offerings of the African American community, residents lived with daily reminders of deprivation caused by this decision. Those reminders were everywhere, at bus stops, department stores, doctor's offices, water fountains, and swimming pools. It was especially painful for parents to see their children watch the excitement at City Park Pool and not be able to take part in the fun. But my parents always told me it was wrong, it was evil, and that uh, one day uh, it was going to change. But uh, by the same token, though, I didn't uh, go around uh, depressed all the time uh, about it. Uh, we utilized the uh, facilities that we had. The long, hot summers in Louisiana drove energetic children. Any place where they could find water, to a large extent, uh, ponds, uh, ditches, and of course, rivers. Marjorie Lawless was well known in the African American community for teaching children at her day school, reading, writing, and arithmetic. She also taught them about some of the finer things in life and the attitude and etiquette needed to acquire them. She often took children on field trips. One day, Mama Lawless decided to introduce her students to City Park. I took my nursery school children over there and they called the police and had the police come and run us off. We couldn't stay. I just wanted a place to take the children to fun, play have fun. They had big uh, slide boats, you know, where they could slide down. And I, I remember when I saw the police car coming up there, I, was, I said, oh my goodness, is we gonna have some trouble now? But they went on back, they didn't stay. We had a time, I'm telling you, it, was, it wasn't easy. And we were very discouraged many, many times, but we kept going. Older kids ventured into water holes where they had easier, although not necessarily safer, access. Most of the, us younger little fellas and most of the elder ones right in that area around over there, we always, always stuck to Graveyard Creek back there. They knew that hole. <laughs> we know that maybe the deeper areas and the shallow areas, for which I was in the shallow area most of the time. I must admit, we've seen a lot of water moccasins back there. We would always checked pretty good before we got in there, but we've seen a few of them back there. We've been around in there so much that there wasn't no logs or sticks or nothing sticking up in it to hurt us or whatever. We didn't have no tree around close enough to swing off of. In South Baton Rouge, all of us had a pool when it would rain. Uh, it wasn't really a swimming pool. <laughs> Matter of fact, it didn't have to rain. If it was a cloud, it looked like the water would rise up to at least sometime three and four feet. We call it Blue Water, and it's located right off of Highland Road where Channel 2 is located, where that sink part down in there. The reason we call it Blue Water because it was so blue until you could see clear, I guess you would say, and you could see the bottom of it. But sometimes children drowned. Freda Taylor drowned in the 
waters behind Fuquay Street, where Memorial Stadium is located. Cartrell Bassett drowned in blue water off Highland Road, where Channel 2 is located. During the summer of 1943, 16-year-old Frank Martinez Jr. went for a swim in City Park Lake. His friends, Henry Claude Pickney and Eugene Poitras, were with him when he died. It was a Sunday when he uh, drowned. What I remember is um, the day that uh, they brought his body to the home for the wake. In those days, uh, families waked their uh, members in the home. I remember lots of people moving about in the house, and I remember this structure, uh, some kind of big piece of furniture in the living room, and my father kneeling beside it and crying, and my mother crying and uh, I couldn't see what was in it. There was a lot of pain, but there was even greater pain, I think, for my father because uh, my father saw so much in, in his, his uh, first son. Even in high school, he would um, write his speeches and he would uh, present them. He did a lot of historical kinds of speeches that he wrote, so he was a, a strong orator even at a young, young age. Months later, the community suffered another tragic loss. Raymond Grigsby drowned while on a scouting trip with Reverend Willie K. Brooks. Reverend Brooks was the scoutmaster of the American Boy Scout Troop 41, based at Shiloh Baptist Church. He was also a deacon at Shiloh. Grigsby was not a member of the church, but he was a member of the Boy Scout Troop. And uh, Reverend Burks had a particular interest in him because not only was he uh, trying to uh, help him become a good scout, but he, he wanted to lead him to Christ. Reverend Brooks knew both Raymond Grigsby and Frank Jr. Brooks worked with Frank's father at Standard Oil, the predecessor of Esso, now known as Exxon Mobil. He was Grigsby's scoutmaster. Anybody who was employed by Standard Oil at that time was considered to be fortunate. And uh, this in itself, along with his uh, involvement in the church uh, and involvement in scouting, uh, made him a, a leader uh, in the community. So Reverend Brooks came up with the idea that something had to be done to keep our children out of the forbidden water. Reverend Brooks decided that somehow we had to get together and do something about a place where our children were safe in the water. He searched around Baton Rouge with the idea that it needed to be near a school. And the only site he could come up with that was comfortable was near our school, the McKinley School. But there was something else there. There was a cemetery that was almost connected with the school. And he said, well, how will we keep them separated? He said, we would have to have a fence. And that fence, as you know, had to be one that I couldn't climb over or nobody else could climb over, but one that would be secure around that pool with gates that were locked with security and that sort of thing. And that is how we came up with the Brooks Park. A lot of families said that this is the opportunity I need for my kids to be water safe and learn how to swim so that they ever get in a situation where they're in water over their heads or water that's not over their heads, they would know how to get themselves to safety. The United Negro Recreational Association was organized on May 22, 1947 to provide wholesome recreation for Negro boys and girls of the city of Baton Rouge. Reverend Brooks was elected president. 
Board members included doctors, teachers, businessmen, and interested citizens from all over the Negro community. Board members had to be careful about how, when, and where they met. He would leave out at night. He would go to meetings, and it was not safe, I guess, for, for Negroes to, to meet more than two or three together. When they were meeting in groups, it was very suspicious. And so they were meeting at um, various places, and one of the places was Blunden Home. The white headmaster from Blunden Home, Marion Wells, was from up north, and she was sympathetic to the struggles of Negroes. Her orphanage on West McKinley Street housed Negro children who attended neighborhood schools. Reverend Brooks was on the board of Blunden Home. Wells allowed Brooks to hold organizational meetings for the United Negro Recreation Association at the orphanage. The association then developed a system for raising money for the park. Team captains led fund drives, both in the community and in area churches. We started to have suppers and dinners where we sold fish and fried chicken and all of the things that went along with it to raise money. And then those of us who were selected or uh, asked to serve on the board had to come up with our own little change to add to it. And then Reverend Brooks sought the help of the churches who were amenable to the cause. And they, in turn, came forward with some money. And that is how we did it. It moved with precision because so many people were interested, because so many young lives had been lost, and they were willing to do anything that they could to see that our children enjoyed the water. Reverend Brooks' determination to build a swimming pool garnered significant interest and financial support from both whites and Negroes. Segregationists thought that building a swimming pool for Negroes would eliminate their bitterness over the lack of access to City Park. In addition, the last thing they wanted was the mixing of races. Most Negroes only wanted their children to have a safe place to swim as quickly as possible to prevent further drownings. They also wanted the least amount of resistance from the white community. But several community leaders disagreed with the strategy for a Negro pool. They wanted more. They wanted access to City Park Pool or a black pool that was paid for by tax dollars. Baton Rouge wasn't uh, Montgomery, uh, Birmingham, or uh, Mississippi, but it had its faults and brutality in the life, but not as bad as some places. So people were complacent. Don't rock the boat. Well, it's time that we rock the boat. Our objective of raising money to build a black swimming pool. I lost out. We were paying taxes. We were part of the community. They had a white swimming pool that we could not use. These are the forceful stands that I think we need to take and to break down segregation. The reason why I made the statement when I gave my $100 that I would not be providing any more money is because I felt that that was the duty and it was the responsibility of the city parish government or the state. Taxpayer money was providing the facilities for the white community. It's supposed to have been proportionately provided for, for the black, and that was not being done. On May 28, 1947, the United Negro Recreational Association purchased four and a half acres of land near the former McKinley High School for $16,000. Some UNRA members were concerned about seating a recreational facility so close to a nearby cemetery, but plans were drawn up anyway, and a pool was to become a part of the plan. In the summer of 1947, the playground was dedicated. Mayor Powers Hickambotham was the main speaker for the ceremony. The new playground provided a wholesome area for Negro children to play. The children also had toys to play with they couldn't even dream of. 
They had never heard of some of these toys. You had the box hockey, which was a square box with the center cross piece in it with two holes. You put the ball on top of the center piece and a person on each side of it would have a stick. That was called the box hockey. And you had the ping pong tables. You had the horseshoe, croquette, and we had a bunch of badminton around. And they had all of the swings and stuff that's over there. And they had other things like softballs for the play ball and basketballs. They had a few footballs around too. There was much more to come. Two years later on February 12, 1949, leaders in the community broke ground amid much fanfare for the Brooks Park Pool. Workers spent months building the pool. The community, especially the children, waited with great anticipation. I came back one day and I asked a man what were they going to build and he told me a swimming pool. And when he said that, <laughs> I think as some of the older people say, looks like an angel or something lit up or lit my face up when he said a swimming pool because we would have somewhere to go swimming because at the time we were swimming anywhere. We had a little hole, had some water in it, which they had one back crossed by the track in the graveyard that they called Graveyard Creek. The UNRA dedicated the pool on Sunday, October 9th, 1949. Felton G. Clark, the president of Southern University, addressed the very appreciative audience. The children couldn't wait until the formalities were over and they could take their first dip in their pool. Reverend Brooks let everybody know that I was leading the line. I gave him the very first 25 cents. That's what it cost to get in there, 25 cents. He had a whole group of us to get in the pool, but he said, first, I'm going to be the very first one to get in. We had so many people in the pool there, we would let them swim from 1 o'clock until 3.30 or 4 o'clock, and then we would just clear the pool out and let another group come in. This went on for at least, I would say at least a month before it started calming down to where we wouldn't have to double shift the pool. The Brooks Park swimming pool was my first experience with swimming and especially formal swimming lessons. The pool became a major gathering spot for children. The one thing that I remember most and probably just as exciting as swimming at Brooks Park was taking a shower, pulling a stream, and having the water just shoot out and flow all over your body. I'd never seen the shower. Nobody in my family had a shower in the bathroom, but Brooks Park had a shower. It was often difficult for parents to pay the admission fee if they had large families or if the kids wanted to swim a great deal. Because there were nine children in my family, uh, and my parents didn't always have enough money for all of us to go swimming. And it wasn't ever that all nine of us was at the age we could swim together, but even if four or five had to go at a time and the cost of swim was quite expensive, Mrs. Helen and Mr. Jim used to let me stack the baskets. So you had to go in, you pay your money, you get a ticket, you walk around to the window, you give your ticket, you get a basket, you undress, put your clothes in the basket, then you gave the basket back and they put your clothes away so they'll be safe. Then when you came out of the pool, you knew your number and you asked for your basket. So people would take their baskets, put their clothes on and leave their baskets on the floor. So they used to let me get in free if I would come and go get all the baskets and stack them and bring them back so they could issue them to the paying customers. You would have thought that we were at an Olympic-sized pool and in great competition because we were all determined every summer that we were going to get better with swimming. We would show up on time for our lessons. We would practice our kicking and our strokes and everything. And the big goal was to jump off of the high diving board. And it was too funny because the first time that they had to coax me off of the high diving board, I actually was able to jump, turn around, and grab onto the board with one hand until I finally slipped off into the water. Few were content with just learning how to swim. Most went on to master various techniques. We hit freestyle, uh, backstroke, 
and a couple other type of swimming moves I really can't name right now. There were several categories that were hosted by Sunbeam Bakery and Tasty Bakery. Tasty Bakery was located in our community. Their techniques got more interesting as the kids got older. Get a jar of Vaseline and put it all over the watermelon and grease it down. Then we would take it and get about 10 people on each side of the swimming pool. But these had to be good swimmers because it was in 10 feet of water. Nobody could stand up. We would have people doing things in the little water shows like, like Betty Sterling. She could got to be able to swim so well, she could read a newspaper while swimming on her back without getting it wet. And we had one thing that was done that scared my mother to death, <laughs> which I had practiced very long time to do, so I knew I could do it. They took me and put me up on the high diving board and tied my hands behind my back and tied my feet together and pushed me off the high diving board off into 10 feet of water. <laughs> And I swam all the way from the 10-foot end of the pool to the 3-foot end. And that, again, too, made all of the youngsters, all of the kids and everybody in the neighborhood respect me so much to the fact they couldn't figure out how I had done that with no hand and feet. But so many black kids knew about dolphins, you know. And this is the way a dolphin swims. The girls wanted to see Tampu dive off of the high diving board. Tampu looked like a black Greek god. He'd walk out to the end of that diving board, proud, legs picked up, pointed toes, and then he'd do one of his magnificent dives. For all of the girls in the pool, I don't care how young we were, we'd all stand in the water and watch his dives. There were tactical victories. Negroes had their swimming pool. However, more battles lay ahead. On June 18, 1953, the United Defense League met and organized a bus boycott in Baton Rouge. Negroes were angry because they were forced to stand when their designated section on public buses filled up, despite the availability of empty seats in the white section of the buses. Within two days, and to support the boycott, the Defense League organized a fleet of 125 vehicles to transport Negroes free of charge. Businessmen like Horatio Thompson furnished much of the gasoline for the vehicles. Community leaders also decided it was time to pursue civil remedies in the courts. They turned to one of the few black lawyers in the community, Johnny Jones, a young man who had yet to try his first case. I was sworn in as a lawyer admitted to the bar on June 11th of 1953. And then on June 26th, when we filed the suit in the bus bar car. That was only two weeks after I had finished law school. Negro leaders led by Reverend T.J. Jemison negotiated a settlement giving whites reserved seating in the front two seats of the bus and Negroes reserved seating in the long back seat. Most Negroes approved of the settlement. However, many resented it saying it was not enough input from the community. The settlement did not end segregation. Many were disappointed that a suit wasn't filed at that time to completely integrate public buses. Despite disagreement over how the Baton Rouge boycott was handled, it soon became clear it served as a blueprint for other bus boycotts nationwide. When the incident took place in Montgomery, Martin Luther came down and met with us. What strategy we used, how did it work, and the cooperation of the people. We told him what we did, how we planned it, and about the filling stations and all cooperating with us. On December 2nd, 1953, the United Negro Recreation Association donated the Brooks Park Pool and Recreation Center to the Baton Rouge Recreation and Parks Commission. It remained a swimming pool for Negroes for several years before the city agreed to pay the operating costs. The pool was then donated to Breck. 
However, the UNRA took steps to make sure that the property would always serve the surrounding community. The group put a reversionary clause in the act of donation that said, should the land cease to be used as a recreation center and or playground, or not be maintained by the Recreation and Park Commission, or its successor, for such purpose, it shall revert to the said United Negro Recreation Association of East Baton Rouge Parish, Louisiana, or its successors or assigns. Also in 1953, an attempt was made to integrate the City Park Golf Course. Malcolm Lagarde, Willie Major, Alvin Scott, Wesley Nichols, Roosevelt Spencer, and Alan White asked to be admitted to the course. The argument was that they paid taxes too, just like their white counterparts. But the arguments didn't make a difference to the gatekeepers. So the young men decided it was once again time to turn to young civil rights attorney Johnny Jones. I didn't know what they were going to do. Next thing I knew, they were down at the city, <laughs> down at the city park. And when he came back from the city park, and everything was do was threatened with arrest, but they wasn't wasn't arrested. And they, they came back, and then I, I and they asked me to file a suit, and I filed a suit for them. Meanwhile, civil rights attorney Thurgood Marshall was taking a case aimed at integrating public schools in Topeka, Kansas, all the way to the nation's highest court. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education a ruling that would serve as the foundation for school integration nationwide. In writing for the court, Chief Justice Earl Warren said, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Speaking with one voice, the court concluded that to achieve the goal of desegregation, the lower federal courts were to enter such orders and decrees to admit children to public schools on a racially non-discriminatory basis with all deliberate speed. When asked his opinion on the High Court's conclusion, then leading civil rights attorney Thurgood Marshall remarked, all deliberate speed meant slow. Shortly thereafter, the NAACP and other civil rights groups filed lawsuits to desegregate elementary and secondary schools across the South. On February 29, 1956, attorneys Alex L. Pitcher, Jr., A.P. Thoreau, Thurgood Marshall, and others filed a federal lawsuit on behalf of 14 Negro families to desegregate schools in the Baton Rouge area. Well, there were a number of reasons why it was filed. For fear of stating the obvious, the parents of African-American children at the time felt largely ignored and disenfranchised. They were being educated in an inferior manner when you compared the quality of their educational offerings to the white students at the time. Compliance with the law of the land was slow. On September 3, 1963, seven years after Brown versus Board of Education, federal judge E. Gordon West ordered the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board to implement desegregation, beginning with high school seniors. The four designated high schools were Baton Rouge High, Robert E. Lee, Estroma, and Glen Oaks. Students involved in the first wave of integration were the community's best and brightest. They, however, faced many hardships. Some of them were, were, were hurt uh, psychologically, um, and we wonder what we were exposing our children to and, and why we were exposing them to, to such um, awful things. People were were so, so very mean and rude to them. And we were wondering about it just because their, their skin was a different shade. It was different color. For young children in your senior year in high school, when you look forward to doing so much and have it all taken away from you, only to be harassed and isolated, we made a pact that no matter how bad it got at the schools, we would never let them see us cry. And there were many days that you wanted to cry when you walked into a classroom and everyone in there walked away and sat at least one row between you so that you're sitting all alone. Or a teacher walks out of the classroom intentionally because they know that the students will throw spitballs at you or books or whatever. Um, to eat alone 
in the lunchroom. But just to go through a whole year of silence without anyone even speaking to you, you, you can't imagine what, what that is, is like. Not only did they not speak to you, but the, when they did decide to speak, it was uh, to denigrate you. Uh, the, the names that they called, um, the way that they talked about you. And even at being at home was not a place of solitude because on weekends they were throwing rotten fruit from the cars. We could not stay in our front yards. Uh, they were hanging dead animals from our porches. They were calling the house and harassing you and calling you names. So for, for that entire year, there was never a moment's peace. After graduating from Lee High School, Freya Anderson Rivers joined the second wave of black students who helped to integrate the undergraduate program at LSU. Freya says she and many other students who spearheaded integration suffered for years from psychological problems, but most went on to get advanced degrees. Rivers got her bachelor's degree from LSU, her master's from Southern University, and her doctorate from Vanderbilt. Thurgood Marshall's statement after the Supreme Court's 1954 ruling in the Brown v. Board of Education case was indeed prophetic. It took the federal government 47 years to oversee the slow integration of the East Baton Rouge Parish school system. Provision was necessary uh, because obviously it didn't happen on its own. So it became necessary for the courts to intervene and do uh, what they did and tell us to do what we must do to provide uh, equity in the instructional programs and, and the facilities and the way we deliver instruction and the materials and the resources that were given to children. Education is a right and a quality education is a right that our children uh, have and regardless of their race or regardless of their uh, environment, their neighborhoods, we must uh, do what's right as far as education goes for the students. While many civil rights lawyers maintained the focus of Brown versus Board of Education was to obtain educational equality for Negro children, the ruling also helped dismantle other Jim Crow laws throughout the South. The civil rights movement spread to sit-ins, marches, freedom rides, protests, and demonstrations. The tactics helped to break down some barriers. When they didn't work, attorneys went to court to challenge Jim Crow. Prior to the ruling, Louisiana State University had been in court continuously from 1946 through 1956, defending segregation. In an April 7, 1956 address to the LSU Board of Supervisors, University President Troy H. Middleton said, In summary, let me emphasize the following point. Louisiana State University has repeatedly made it clear it does not want Negro students. Like several other of the state institutions of higher learning, it admits them under court order. The tightly knit South Baton Rouge community was suffering a setback on another front as well. City leaders reportedly convinced the federal government to build an interstate highway through the community. The United States Transportation Department or the Department of Highways did not want the interstate and its corridor through right through the core of Baton Rouge and that it would become a local uh, artery if we did that and, and uh, they uh, professed to be overcome by the power of politics and, and, and the city fathers at the time. Their priority was moving traffic, moving commerce, and having an artery for a defense purpose if there became a need. Their, their priority is not local economic development. When you ride along and you see those roads that stop right there, you do see that arteries were ended abruptly and that communities were divided uh, in order for the expressway to run there. And in addition, there are people indeed who are not interested in living uh, in that uh, proximity to, to a major interstate. Construction began in 1959. Many Negro families, churches, and businesses were displaced and had to relocate. Many of the gutsy residents of South Baton Rouge, however, were still in place. They continued their fight for change, attempting to integrate City Park Pool in 1963. Their efforts drew the attention of local police and the FBI. They were there with their guns and billy clubs waiting to receive us and asked us where we were going uh, as we walked into the city park and I told them that we were going to swim. United States Supreme Court had made the decision that 
public places was open to all people. And so I knew I had a right to be there. Pearl George, my sister, was with me. Richard Thompson was with us. Sam Green was with us. And James uh, Williams was with us. And there were a host of other people. I went there with one thing on my mind. And that thing was, I knew that I wasn't going to be allowed to swim. But I went there knowing that I had to try. Somehow, I looked around and there were FBI and police officers and everybody was there already. Um, and the lifeguard stood across the door to block our way in. Relatives say Pearl George was driven to eliminate segregation at almost any cost. They say she never thought about danger or fear before acting on her beliefs. One of the times that I was arrested at that sit-in swimming pool, they said that I had cut the chief of police, Chief Wendy White, who was white, of course. And I got charged and convicted mm -hmm. of aggravated battery. And of course, you know, I did, what was it, six months in the, at the time of East Bunny Sheriff's Jail. My sister Pearl spent over two and a half years of her life in and out of prison, out of jail, for different civil rights activities. The first time she went to jail was for the integration of the courtrooms. Then uh, she went to jail for the integration of the coffee shops at the courthouse. And um, each time she went to jail, she refused to bond out. She said, and then, uh, of course, we were both arrested at City Park. Attorneys on the front lines of the civil rights struggles often found themselves in danger. We had a lot of threats. I had called and tell me that when I walk out of my office that I was going to be shot, going to meet a bullet going right through the forehead and all of that. I had two cars bomber. They bombed my car when I was on Grimble. Government Street, my car, I got in the car and turned the switch on. The automobile flew up and went on the top of the building. I just turned the key off and jumped out and just burned all the shrubbery up down beneath. But that was after the city park. The attorneys continued to forge ahead, despite threats, feeling that being treated as second-class citizens was worse than being threatened. Johnny Jones and others were in U.S. Middle District Court fighting for the integration of the city park pool in 1964. That's when word reportedly leaked of a U.S. Supreme Court decision in an integration case that would seal the fate of a favorable ruling for blacks in the City Park case. The ruling had not been handed up yet. Just days before the ruling came down, the Park Commission shut down every public pool in the city, including City Park Pool. Mayor Woody Dumas was once asked whether he would reopen the pool. He replied, A lot of people don't see eye to eye on this matter and we must be practical about these things. City Park has never reopened. Now they fill it in, but for a while it just stood there as an eyesore. And anybody that knew, anybody in the community that knew the reason is because they didn't want to integrate. It was a black-white tension zone. The three former Negro pools, Anna T. Jordan, Gus Young, and Brooks, and two former white pools, Howell and Webb, reopened two years later, despite opposition. Both Howell and Webb Parks were bombed within weeks of the time they reopened. It was an apparent attempt to prevent Negroes from having access to the formerly all-white pools. But crews were able to repair the damage in time for the pools to open on schedule. The president of WBRZ-TV, Douglas Manship, offered a $1,000 reward for information leading to the persons responsible for the attack. The Citizens Council filed a resolution saying the opening of the pools on an integrated basis will cause trouble and increase chaotic conditions in the protection of our social institutions by destroying the freedom of choice to associate with our own race. Meanwhile, white segregationist groups, such as the Southern Gentlemen and the Citizens Council, fought to preserve what was called the Southern way of life. Segregationist fought integration step by step all the way. 
it, it was amazing. I exerted a lot of energy in getting rid of segregation, but the energy I and others like me exerted on desegregation was nothing compared to the energy that the whites made to maintain segregation. They worked at it. What you had was uh, an all-white brick board. Mm -hmm. And you had about 55 people involved in brick committees, volunteers. Every single one was white. So we got some black people together who would agree to be a committee member and sent that information to Breck. Nothing happened, not at that time. African Americans pursued daunting tasks in the face of fear and against all odds because they believed strongly in their cause. Several leaders ran for political office during the 1960s. Dupe Anderson ran for mayor, Johnny Jones ran for district attorney, and A.C. Belton ran for several offices. Although none was elected to office at the time, it demonstrated the importance of courting the black vote. Civil rights attorneys remained busy for decades, fighting off local and state government attempts to restrict the civil rights movement. Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, Elaine Jones, A.P. Thoreau, Louis A. Martinet, Johnny Jones Sr., Alex Pitcher Jr., and Murphy Bell used the legal system to fight for equality. Often threatened, they were never intimidated. We had gone to court, desegregated everything before the Civil Rights Act had paid. We had tried recreation, we had the bus suit, we had sit-ins, and all of those things came about. By the time the Civil Rights Act passed, we almost led the, the nation in the Civil Rights Movement. Victories in the courthouse were often neutralized by state and local governments resisting change, and this generated more intense frustration among Negroes. To cool things off in May of 1963, Baton Rouge Mayor Jack Christian announced the formation of a biracial committee. Christian publicly charged the committee with establishing better communication among the various segments of the city. The committee remained in operation for decades, serving both mayors, Christian and Woody Dumas but some doubted whether the efforts were genuine. I think they kept the level of, of uh, revolt on the part of the blacks and whites down. Looks like they were going to do some good. The segregation white folks hoped that the commission would hold back the blacks, and the blacks hoped that we'd, <laughs> they'd go forward. So uh, I don't know exactly what they did. I can't think of what they did accomplish. The East Baton Rouge Parish Ministerial Alliance and the Baton Rouge Council on Human Relations were also involved in reducing racial tensions in the community. Members of the Council on Human Relations wrote hundreds of letters to mayors, U.S. cabinet members, and local businessmen asking for equality in hiring practices, equal access to public facilities, and fair housing practices. The organization also demanded that African Americans be treated the same as whites when frequenting public businesses, regardless of who owned them. But many agencies, including the Baton Rouge Police Department, continued to resist integration. There were 271 people on the police force in 1967. Every white person on the force threatened to resign if forced to ride in the same vehicles with black officers. Mayor Woody Dumas decided to leave things as they were rather than risk losing the police officers. This was all happening as hundreds of African Americans were marching from Bogalusa to Baton Rouge. The group was demanding civil rights. The Council on Human Relations and other liberal white leaders sensed the need for Negro representation in the city's leadership. Baton Rouge was one-third black. They supported and helped elect Joseph Del Pitt to a citywide seat in 1968. The first thing that moved Breck on racial matters was uh, the election of Joe Delpit because the city council named the members of, of Breck and the city parish council was all white until some of us got together and helped elect uh, Joe Delpit, became the first black person member of the city council. Then. The way the Breck commissioners were appointed, 
apparently. Not according to the law, but a custom. Uh, it looked like uh, a particular seat on Breck was controlled by a particular person who was on the city council. You know, this was, became Joe Delpit's seat, really, and he named a black person. In 1969, the city council appointed Willie Spooner to the Recreation and Park Commission. He's a very confident man, and in spite of obstacles and racial barriers that he had to encounter, he continued to move forward and be positive and work towards building young people. The city council appointed at least one Negro to each of the Breck committees. Blacks, however, accused Baton Rouge leaders of making token concessions. They said whites wanted to maintain segregation without risking the city's well-being. African Americans became more confident in leadership in City Hall when Jewel Newman was elected to the city council in 1973. Howard Marcellus and the woman who led the battle to integrate City Park, Pearl George, were elected in 1977. Baton Rouge has had strong black representation on the city council ever since, and even elected its first African-American mayor, Melvin Kip Holden, in 2004. While the African-American community welcomes a more diverse and open-minded city, it also despairs at what the community has given up in the name of progress, going back to the approval of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. After the law passed, people were very jubilant. I did not even think about the economic impact that it would have in a negative way on the things that we had developed in our community. So there were restaurants that went out of business, there were uh, theaters that went out of business, there were the social uh, halls where people would gather for balls that all went out of business. And yes, some of the black businesses attempted to compete. But if you lost a large share of your market, it was not easy to compete. While black businesses often found it hard to compete after the elimination of racial segregation, black professionals were often given better job assignments under the desegregation decree. The East Baton Rouge Parish School Board elected its first black president, Dr. Press Robinson, in 1985. The board appointed the system's first black superintendent, Charlotte Placide, in 2004. It was under her leadership that the board decided to rebuild the aging McKinley Middle Magnet School. But the board needed additional land to build the school. We were short of about two acres. And in our discussions, and we've been, had a longstanding relationship and partnership with Breck, uh, we were going to acquire those through a land swap because they had some capital uh, uh, improvements underway uh, there on the drawing board for that area. The whole matter just piqued my interest. And sure enough, I read the act of donation, and there was a clause that said that if the property was ever transferred uh, for a purpose other than recreation, that it would revert back to the United Negro Recreational Association. After rechartering the United Negro Recreational Association, we intervened in the lawsuit where the school board was trying to get clear title to the property. In exchange for a release of the UNRA's reversionary interest in the property, the school board agreed to name rooms in the newly built middle school after UNRA original members and other community leaders, and to help preserve the history of Brooks Park and the surrounding community. The Recreation and Parks Commission agreed to allow the UNRA to place monuments around Brooks Park swimming pool. The Old South Baton Rouge community is not only trying to build on the legacy of McKinley Middle and Brooks Park, it is also trying to recapture much of the spirit and legacy of the entire community. The community looks forward to a brighter future, one the city of Baton Rouge and the state of Louisiana can rally behind with pride and mutual respect. South Baton Rouge is experiencing a revitalization and rebirth in mind and spirit. When we can collaborate and, and make use of the resources that the school system has, as well as collaborate with entities such as the YMCA uh, and bring all of these resources to, to, together, you can have a far greater uh, experience, a much healthier experience, and a far-reaching experience when you can put up pool all these resources. That's what's going on uh, in our collaboration with McKinley Middle School and the Recreation Park System. 
they utilize the Brooks Park swimming pool, they utilize other uh, recreation venues, uh, a first tee golf program is being developed uh, to expose children to golf. Um, and of course the recreation and park system has access, full access to the gymnasium and other uh, classroom venues right so that uh, we can do first. after school tutoring kinds of things and, and, and what have you. So it's a tremendous collaboration and, uh, and it's a great idea. I think that we have a sense of what has happened and I see now that people are coming back to the community, people wanting to go to the Temple Roof uh, event, people wanting to go to the Purple Circle for events, and now they'll also be able to go to the old McKinley High School Auditorium. However, there's been a consistent thread running through the South Baton Rouge community for six decades, the Brooks Park Pool. Hundreds of children flock to the pool each summer to keep cool and learn how to swim. It's very important to be able to bring the children somewhere cool and fun, very inexpensive, safe, and not too far away so we can get them all there. They're a whole lot more cooperative at home and at our little church camp when they, can, when they know that they're going to go swimming. I'll do my lesson. <laughs> so that I can go to the park, I'll do my chores. This has been like this. To order a copy of this program, visit our website at www.lpb.org or call 1-800-973-7246. You can also write to the address on your screen. Funding for this program has been provided by the East Baton Rouge Parish School System and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.